Hi all. Okay, um, I thought uh, we'd look at Gaspar at Nixic 1983 um, this evening with uh, Gaspar having uh, the white pieces. We'll look at Gaspar, sorry, not the white pieces, the black pieces. So, uh, why Nixic? Uh, I thought it was a fascinating tournament. Um, it came onto the radar recently. I think it was Gligoric's uh, birthday, 60th birthday. And a lot of really, really strong players were in this tournament, making it a Category 14 event. And what I find particularly interesting is, because uh, part of the black pieces, uh, we're going to flip the board. Uh, in this tournament, we witness him making use of the Tarash defence. And um, you may already be aware that... Um, the, the next year, 1984, I mean, he was challenging uh, Anatoly Karpov and he nearly got wiped out by Karpov. Um, well, many draws, but he nearly got wiped out um, when K Karpov nearly got the five points required. But uh, there were a few dodgy Tarash defences. Now, maybe this tournament contributed to Kasparov's confidence in making use of the Tarash defence. So that would be interesting to kind of investigate. Uh, when we look at these games. Now this first game against Yasser Sirwan is, is also interesting for another reason. I've been checking out um, earlier today Yasser Sirwan's book on tactics which I think I'd recommend uh, to, to people to, to, to get actually. It's a very very clear concise book. The only uh, slight flaw I find is the diagrams are a bit too small uh, for the for the challenges, um, they're, they're a bit too small. But I found myself compelled to try them all out actually um, earlier. So the tactics um, breakdown is very very logical, um, and it starts with, uh, for example, double attacks, and then goes on from there. And um, it's it's claimed well. An assertion is is that the double attack in the wider sense is a basis for most uh, tactics and combinations. Um, Yuri Averbach uh, made that claim. Anyway, so that's an aside. So Yasser Sirwan's book is worth checking out. But here he was in 1983 uh, as white against Kasparov. So he plays d4. And Kasparov plays d5. And we see now this use of the c4 e6. It's not going to be a standard uh, Queen's Gambit decline. Uh, with, with say knight f6 or even the way to move bishop e7 but instead this aggressive move which I don't know how many of you have tried but c5 c5 here so not moving any knight or anything just creating uh, a lot of tension in the center so the Tarash defense which uh, you know the, the next year as I say I think Kasparov was, was keen to try this against Anatoly Karpov but late, later he switched to the Grunfield um, I think against Karpov with much greater effect so why was the Tarish so powerful well let's see what happened in this game um, is it really dangerous for the black player to accept uh, the isolated Queen's pawn so the isolated Queen's pawn is, is very likely to occur from this opening because white has the option now of taking on d5 after e takes d5 uh, these two pawns uh, are quite vulnerable to being pressurized and black might be encouraged to play c takes d4 at some point leaving the isolated Queen's pawn so let's see knight f3 knight c6 so again, not moving any kingside piece at the moment, just putting more pressure on d4. Okay, g3, and this is the classic like Rubenstein recommendation, I think, against the Tarash. Akiba Rubenstein was, uh, I think, the first to sort of use g3 al along a number of systems, against a number of black systems, uh, to neutralize um, often black's counterplay and, and make white's king a little bit safer. So, okay, knight f6, bishop g2, bishop e7, and both sides now castle. Yasa plays bishop g5 now. And here, with the kind of possibilities emerging here, like d takes c5 with pressure on d5 and bishop f6, Kasparov takes now on d4. I think this is a very tricky um, 
system to get the hang of uh, by taking on d4 now okay so black is voluntarily letting white get a temporary uh, blockade hopefully not too permanent on that d5 pawn weakness the isolated queen's pawn okay so what has black got in compensation for this structural concession well usually for structural concessions like this the bishops are alive we've got a potentially a live rook on the e farm potential use of the, the c file as well so active pieces basically h6 and now white takes on f6 and black recaptures with immediate uh, threat on d4 so knight b3 and you might think well what can black do now about this d5 pawn this looks tricky already and if it moves forward what about the weakened light squares well it does move forward here not minding the concession on the light squares so Yasser pounces in with knight e4 attacking the bishop uh, and then maybe there's a possibility of taking and taking on d4 if, if black's not careful black actually played bishop e7 preserving for a moment the dark square bishop rook c1 and white seems to have a fine square to use this c5 square on that semi-open file with at the moment a slightly in development but black has three pieces freer pieces more active uh, than usual in say a queen's game it declined so has this concession of this slightly weakened d pawn been worth it now what if i ask everyone watching this you know to evaluate this position if i give you 20 seconds here what what side would you prefer here white or black given what i've said so 20 seconds starting from now to evaluate Um, someone in unreadable green font on stream has mentioned I'd say black is underdeveloped is that Stefan um, player in the game I've had success in bashing Tarash okay anyone play chess come on come on any any evaluations come on do you prefer white or black <laughs> Stefan uh, okay so um, all right let's see how how does uh, black handle this situation well he this this queen is blocked actually from using uh, the queen side squares and in fact black's queen is free to use b6 here and he makes use of b6 which still provides support here for d4 okay now knight ec5 okay now rook d8 supporting again d4 yasa plays now rook c4 is that pawn in mortal danger here well in this position now Gary gives up his dark square bishop with bishop takes c5 knight takes c5 now is played offering the b2 pawn okay queen takes b2 and what is white's idea here you might ask well there's a lot of pressure on the black position and yes simply trades queens after this pawn sack maybe you might consider this a very surprising uh, concept but he's going to have lots of pressure on the queen side queen takes c2 rook takes c2 so there's immediate uh, potential for example maybe a knight takes uh, b7 and bishop takes c6 potentially rook b8 is played here and now rook b2 um, threatens if, if nothing else well well it threatens immediately bishop takes c6 okay so rook d6 rook d1 okay so at the moment what is this pawn sacrifice about you might ask what has yasa done b6 and now after knight b3 again this pawn is in real danger so white's gonna get his pawn back it seems he's bullying the pawn now with rook bd2 now even if white gets the pawn back uh, black has this two to one pawn majority so that's something to bear in mind here this two to one pawn majority if a few pieces get get swapped off when white rest restores 
the material balance. What will happen after? Rook BD8, King F1. Now Bishop A6, which allows this simplification now. So White gets the pawn back. Bishop takes C6, Knight takes D4. Okay, so Rook C5. So White's got the pawn back. Knight B3, exchanging off a pair of rooks. Rook takes D2, Rook takes D2. Rook C7. So we have this ending now with, again, Black's trump card seems to be in this position, the 2-1 to one pawn majority. Um, can White make use, effective use of this knight versus the bishop? Can he can he get his own uh, majority in the centre working? Okay, well, let's see. Rook d8 check is played. King e1, unpinning the pawn at least, and the king's ready for action as well. Bishop c4. What was the reason for bishop a6? I think it was quite an annoying move. Um, Let's let's go back in the second pass. Let's just go through the game first. Second pass, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that. So bishop a6, I'll make a note of your question, uh, Rahim. Rahanim. So um, king d2, g6. Let's have a quick check of this ending. So knight c1, king g7. The black king is becoming activated now. After a3, okay, safely putting, for the moment, the pawn away from the light square bishop. King f6, now e3, again, putting the pawns away from the clutches of the light square bishop. King e7, rook d4. As, as we know from a previous uh, broadcast, Yasser had beaten uh, once uh, Kasparov in one of the Olympiads. Uh, that was a very interesting uh, game. Uh, so Yasser is one of the few people to have, have beaten Kasparov. So rook d7. Now king c3, and we have another rook exchange. Okay, b5, and now knight d3. So surely uh, white can't lose this ending, uh, or can he? Well, in this position, bishop takes d3 is played, so we get a king and pawn ending. And no, they're not going to agree a draw here. Kasparov has this 2 to 1 pawn majority, but how to make use of it? King d6 e4 and now the move g5 is played which has has the potential threat of g4 which would lock down two pawns really with the en passant available if, if g4 is achieved uh, so perhaps for this reason white plays f4 to keep his pawns seemingly uh, fluid g takes f4 g takes f4 now we see king c5. So can black actually make use of the 2 to 1 here? King c3. a5. So an outside pass pawn seems to be on the cards. King d3. h5. And now these two pawns are fixed against each other on this side. Now b4. OK. And we have a protected pass pawn emerging here. A protected pass pawn because white plays a4 but how can black actually win this in this position okay well white's pool majority here can be suppressed tactically uh, with the move f6 so if white ever dares to play e5 there isn't there isn't time for a pawn sack this pawn, this king can get to this pawn so if there's no time for e5 Okay, how can black make use of the protected pass B pawn here? Well, white actually plays F5, okay, which might create the tactical threat of E5 and then F6 later. But uh, as long as the king is, is aware of that, it steps back now. This triangulation uh, method is what makes the game uh, quite instructive here. The king steps, steps back with king C6. King c4, and now back again, knowing that you know if the white king cannot venture because of b3, okay, so it has to stick around. And now in this position, 
Okay, king, we see this kind of triangle movement. King d7, sort of lose a tempo effectively. King c6, okay, king d3 now, king c5. And we have a better position than before now with the king kind of uncomfortable. And again, white is unable to play e5 at any time. King e3. But now this move requires uh, precise calculation. This move next, making use of the protected pass pawn, requires some some specific calculations. So b3 is played here, and it's very good in this position, as we'll see now. So if king tried to come to the rescue, king d3, king b4, which is leaving now these two pawns for this tactic okay which you might consider very very dangerous and it is tried out here e5 okay but in this position um, instead of you know taking would be a check here wouldn't it which would be a very important tempo instead Kasparov actually plays King a3, which also means that this pawn is definitely being forced through. You know, King c3 is not sitting on a blockade on b2. Okay. And it also means, by the way, that this pawn is with check. So it's the destination queening squares providing these checks is, is quite interesting. So black's trying to make use of that check. So black's pawn, because of this, could be quicker here. After e takes f6, we see b2, and the black pawn is pretty quick. It's with check. Oh dear, just one move is in this. One single move. This is a very high-profile game for a king and pawn ending to be played with triangulation. So king c2, king a2, and black is queening first with the check. And here, yes, that has to resign. I don't know if any of you have seen this game before, but it's um, I know it's it's simplicity, but uh, and it doesn't doesn't seem like a an attack from the Tarash at all. All it was was an emergent two to one pawn majority, which created an outside protected pass pawn, and then a very fine triangulation there in the ending. Single tempo, yes. Let's have a look at this again. So the use of the Tarash like this seem, might seem quite strange uh, to some of you, many of you. But this is how it was used here in this game, in this particular game. In other games, Kasparov has created very dynamic, aggressive attacks. But uh, it was Yasser that did the pawn sacrifice for a lot of pressure, as we saw in this game. Um, and really, okay, so knight takes d4, the classic blockade on the United States Queen's pawn. And then this, this pawn, is it weak or is, is it okay? What's happening to it? So white gets that important, seemingly important c5 square. The dark square bishop goes and it is this pawn sack to win b2. So this queen b6 was multi-purpose, protecting d4 and putting pressure on b2. You know, when, when this queen b6 had been played earlier, it's a key move, it seems, in this position, as, as evidenced by this game. Okay, so the queen exchange, it looks, you know, intuitively, well, should black have problems here? Well, it turned out that, okay, he, he's going to lose d4. Um, so there was a question, why was bishop a6 played? Okay, let's, let's try and address this question. Why was bishop a6 played in this position? Now, possibly... Possibly white can win this pawn by force with knight takes d4. Can't really turn on an engine here, I'm afraid, if you if you guys want to. But there's also bishop takes c6, maybe, to just take on d4 more simply. So this pawn's dropping off whatever, you know, maybe it can be a transposition even if bishop a6 wasn't uh, played. 
So Kasparov is basically counter-sacrificing the pawn and putting pressure on e2. He's giving up the pawn. There's no way of holding on to the pawn, is there? Let's let's try and move like king f8 as an example. You know, bishop takes c6, and then we play knight takes d4. And also we're setting ourselves up tactically for knight e6. This would be a disaster in this position. Knight e6, splat. Okay, so bishop a6 is just safely returning the pawn. I'm not sure what anyone else has to say about this bishop a6. Um, sorry, who asked this question? Rohimin, I don't know what else to say about bishop a6. Black was a pawn up. He wants to safely give back the pawn, as far as I can tell. Is, is, that, is that okay? Um, is that satisfactory? I'm not really sure what else to say about it um, he knows that his d pawn is doomed and he's, he's trying to sort of um, use the two to one pawn majority what if white did not allow uh, the, the b pawn sack well let's have a look there that's that's an interesting one as well so why did white uh, sacrifice the b pawn um, well if white doesn't sacrifice the b pawn well there is pressure on his outpost Okay, so let's 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 imagine a move like Queen D two then. So what active possibilities uh, would be here for Black? I wonder. So something springs to mind that this is kind of a loose reinforcement of both knights. Uh, what about the move A five? I mean, could this be unpleasant for White if A four is a major threat? Maybe white doesn't want this sort of position because it might turn out to be quite passive. These, these knights might be a tactical uh, vulnerability. So the way Yasser uh, maybe saw it was to sacrifice the pawn and regain it and then agree a draw in the end game, which, which wasn't the case. Uh, I think this, this might be a slightly loose tactical position. So it seems may maybe the Tarish does encourage um, slightly loose pieces. From the opponent, it's it's very interesting. I've never really understood myself the use of the Tarish because I've never actually played it. I more prefer Kasparov's King's Engine. I've never really checked out in detail uh, Kasparov's use of the Tarish defense. So this is this is really interesting. But um, okay, so in the game we saw this um, in this game a simplification then and giving back the pawn and just winning. Uh, the most sim most simplified type of ending, king and pawn ending. So it was it was kind of impressive, um, maybe, uh, for using the outside um, pass pawn and critical tempo triangulation, and this critical timing to make sure. Well, once once the king was there, um, if if the king went here, by the way, I think just king d4, and this 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 king will mop up these. So that's why the king had to go onto a light square, and then of course b3 is with check. So this king comes here to play b3, b2, b1. Okay. All right. Let's look at other game now. With black, so we'll be looking at the black pieces to start off with this week this is a bit of a brutal game um, it seems on my initial playthrough so uh, Lobomir Lobojevic um, okay so he's white against Kasparov Nick Sick 1983 so e4 and Kasparov plays the Sicilian defense after knight f3 e6 d3 playing quietly not mainline Sicilians so Kasparov simply reacts with knight c6 and now challenges the center, d5. Finchetto is the bishop. White castles, knight g e7. After rook e1, b6. Okay. White plays um, h4 here, which looks like a, an old Fisher plan, h4. You know, the the old Fisher plan in the King's Engine <clears throat> attack type systems would be, you know, involved in, in dark square control. Okay, black plays h6 after c3 
Now a5, which gives the possibility maybe of bishop a6 later and also clamping down maybe on b4s from white, a4. But there's another purpose behind a5, which is very interesting. The a7 square, believe it or not. Rook a7, rook a7, wow. Uh, you'll see that this is significant. If both rooks want to join forces later, this rook a7 is a very significant move, believe it or not, in this game. Knight b3, Engspraf takes his space in the center with d4. And it's also note off off the dangerous diagonal for, for pins and tactics like that. So rook a7, can it switch over later? That's the question. C takes d4, C takes d4. <clears throat> White plays now bishop d2, and black now, Sparf plays e5. And this bishop looks nice. And this g4 square is vulnerable because of that h4, the weakness of the g4 square. I don't know if uh, Lobojevic was tired that day. His play seems a bit passive, to be quite honest, in this game. But maybe he's one of many Kasparov opponents feeling a bit terrified of Kasparov and end up sometimes playing passive type games. Uh, this doesn't inspire too much confidence down the white's position after knight c1 uh, because you know black has the, the space advantage and the nice bishops um, you know bishop e6 nice control on on these squares rook e2 and now finally Kasparov castles and of the bishop e1 just a, you know a plan which seems so natural now is played uh, the, just to play f5 f4 just making use of the rook on its natural uh, position just gain space on the king side okay but it has a small twist to it so f5 of the knight d2 f4 and you might think well what about is there any concessions here like light squares well white is not in the position to get rid of the light square bishops these knights are a bit hopeless here at the moment um, White is in the position to play f3 because he's got a bishop on e1 protecting g3 and he, he does play f3 uh, okay but it, it's it's a pretty bad position here okay f takes g3 bishop takes g3 but you might think how does black actually proceed in this position Okay, now um, if I give you uh, 20 seconds, can you guess the move which Kasparov plays here? Well, actually, you probably could, but maybe the reason behind it is, is deeper. Uh, so what, what would you play here as black? Um, okay, a very energetic move, and the idea behind it is played. G5. The idea behind it is not to, after HG, to recapture with the pawn, but instead make this a very powerful pawn sacrifice. He plays knight G6, which gives the option now of queen G5, which would be hitting, you know, the king. You don't want a pawn there when the queen could be there pinning pieces and stuff so it's been made into a vicious pawn sacrifice and white accepts the pawn sacrifice he plays g takes h6 and we get this lovely bishop now on the diagonal and note this rook is ready to swing in to one of these two key squares so it's a very dangerous position now has emerged from this very logical kind of natural smooth flowing attack on the king side. Knight f1 is played, fending off at least e3 for a moment. Rook g7, vicious threats now, like knight f4, knight h4. After rook f2, 
in this position bishop e3 is played and white seems to be uh, in in dire straits actually um other than the musical reference so if knight takes e3 well this wasn't played but it, i guess it will be quite horrendous after a move say knight f4 we'd have a horrible pawn here and knight d4 coming so this this would be appalling wouldn't it for white and a hemmed in bishop knight d4 is huge that would be quite appalling for white so white actually wanted to give up the exchange he plays b3 but Xpath didn't take the rook no instead he just plays knight f4 on move 25 and the Bojevic has had enough of his position he resigns here so it was strange a strange game because it seems as though white was playing like um a rabbit in the headlights uh the whole game uh it's strange um not not his best um okay maybe game so let's have a look again so it was passive play punished um but uh some instrumental moves you know a5 for this rook a7 is interesting and then we see this this powerful pawn sacrifice this g5 concept is is very interesting for black's pieces the queen bishop all spring into life stemming from this pawn set this bishop to be on this diagonal this knight to get this this rook to get that so it's all springing into life from the pawn sack okay um so any questions on that should we go on to another game let's go on to another game shall we not maybe not Lebovich's best day maybe he's been parting with Kogorich it was his uh birthday after all maybe uh their late night party the night before or something okay so uh this is uh now the great dane uh bent larson as white plays against Kasparov. uh this this is quite a long game 55 moves c4 so the english opening okay after e6 knight c3 d5 d4 okay a transposition into now yes another tarash so let's see how this tarash shapes up shapes up <laughs> sorry c5 c5 now so again there's no movement of the knight just just creating this huge tension in the center giving white the option to isolate a queen's pawn but it liberates the bishop you see this capture is liberating this bishop so there's peace liberation implications that both bishops and we have potential files so it's it's to do with the bishops and the rooks are going to enjoy the position later hopefully so knight f3 knight c6 okay <laughs> so i'm sorry what triple pawns c5 is so unsound it's it's a tarish defense the tarish defense is still kicking away isn't it today Am I mistaken? Although I haven't seen it that often, it's usually uh, Slav defences nowadays in Groomfields. Is it has has the Tarish passed its its heyday? Probably. Okay. So G three knight f six. Bishop G two bishop e seven. Now both sides castle. Okay. But another property of a pawn on d five in this kind of situation are these outpost points okay and we see that now off the b3 the move knight e4 and this this looks active you know bishop b2 bishop f6 it looks active for black but again this this sensitive c5 square white players are tending to grab onto that c5 square so knight a4 okay Kaspar not too worried rookie eight he's got the pin at the moment on the bishop in any case Rook c1 and now b6 white takes offering an exchange of bishops bishop takes knight takes b takes c5 so we have hanging pawns hanging pawns will they hang <clears throat> for this 
Knight a4. Okay, well, at least there's no queen b6 resource in this game. So, what does black do about this? <clears throat> well, he's got count play here. <clears throat> he plays bishop a6. So, if white dares to take, then we have backfire on e2 at the moment. Rook e1. And now c4. The hanging pawns are being fixed, though, aren't they? Or is black creating a dangerous pass pawn? Knight h4. And now an aggressive move. Not b6, but a5 is used. So this queen is, is very nasty in the Tarash as well. It's It's got a free movement here to a5. Off knight f5, g6. Blockade. Okay. h4 now. Knight e5. Bishop h3 kicking the rook to c7. Knight c2. Is white actually in a passive position now? If you look at black's pieces, aren't they all pretty great here? This seems to be a small concession. Who, who, uh, I think I've biased your assessment. If I asked you to evaluate this, sorry, can I give you uh, 20 seconds and I'll be back? Sorry, in about 20. I'll be back in about half a minute. Have a look at this position and try and evaluate it. Okay, I'll be back in about 30 seconds. Pardon me. <laughs> Sorry, a bit longer than 30 seconds. Um, so who who thinks white's um, passive? Uh, is black doing fine from the Tarash? It's pretty good. It's a good advert for the Tarash defence, isn't it? This position or not? Anyone? <clears throat> white's knights are on holiday on A4. Yes, this, this looks like um, not so relevant as before. Okay. C takes B3 is played. A takes B3. So we do have this isolated queen's pawn, yes. Bishop C8. But what about white's king safety? White doesn't want to exchange off the light squared bishop. Knight G4 heading for that soft spot. That looks vulnerable. That's protected. Is black's play based on threat? Threat after threat. Bishop D7. And now rook a1 supporting that. And now forcing move, bishop takes a4. After rook takes a3, black gets access to the c3 square with that exchange. And he's now threatening c2. So each move so far, there's been a string of forcing moves there from black. <clears throat> and um, the knight has to move or something. So bishop takes e4, giving up maybe an important knight square defender. Never know. D takes e4. In this position, e3, a clever defense perhaps, because g4 is now under fire. But uh, Sprov doesn't take on c2, he takes on b3. Okay. And now another clever move, it seems, from the Great Dane. Rook takes e4, a tactical 
uh, deflection for this queen d8 check maybe to pick up the rook and that's allowed by Smarov. rook takes e4 check picking up the rook okay and protecting the knight and inviting it seems a fork but then again what happens black white will have the move after that so rook c4 with white's move he has a saving move here uh, for this this fork <laughs> um, which is knight d4 hitting the queen so is has white tricked Kasparov into getting uh, this position or is this this fine for black well black has <laughs> an a-pawn here so he doesn't mind simplification what is this about Kasparov's games in this tournament he, he's gone into two endings now from this Tarish defense which seems a paradox to use this opening to get end games uh, but where is the isolated queen's one it's disappeared a long time ago and blacks ended up with a pass outside a-pawn okay so rook c2 and a more active rook and knight after the smoke's cleared here knight d4 rook a2 so white's really uh, in a grim position surely with this this rook uh, just just passive compared to black's rook e4 which was anchoring the knight on d4 so that's now attacked knight c6 attacking the pawn a6 keeping that for a moment e5 and now rook e2 okay and does this rook want to spend the rest of the game on f1? Uh, what about e5? Black's just going to be a pawn up. It's going to be it's going to be winning. Rook a1, offering f2 now for a6. Is that a fair trade? Rook takes f2. Rook takes a6. Rook c2. Okay, now the rook has to nanny the knight. If the knight moves, then knight e5. It's going to be nasty. H5 okay now here the king is used aggressively king h6 after hg hg rook a4 and the king comes to the rescue of the knight now so there's still pressure now basically on e5 after all this so knight d4 hitting the rook rook c3 so now two things are under fire e6 giving up now this is very very clever giving up um, g3 it seems for this this dangerous pawn uh, check okay but the cleverness is here okay this looks like a dangerous pass pawn on e6 after f5 uh, there's a there's an idea well can, can the rook and knight or this pawn be useful e7 rook e3 getting behind the pawn knight c6 so if white has an extra move or two then he's queening his pawn but black is not just having this pawn it's also supporting mating nets between rook and knight here after f4 check and the king is stepping in very menacingly to g3 so there's a mating net scenario being generated here in this ending it's not what it seems it's not just about past pawns the white kings potentially getting mated now in many variations rook a8 for the moment the pawn is stopped with knight f6 okay king g2 and now f3 check okay now if king f2 here then there's potentially a knight g4 check the king actually went to f1 and we see now king g3 and now okay knight d4 and black has time now for knight g4 offering uh, this which isn't um, taken because uh, I think white would be in trouble he didn't do this let's have a quick look check check and just mating 
so that that's not possible e8 I believe so in this position white tried knight takes f3 but I think he ends up with another mating that after check king g1 because prof now threatens mate with knight h2 threatening rook f1 mate rook f8 is played okay but um now does rook c3 again if if white queens well here actually white resigned if he queens then he's still getting mated with the check and then the mate like this so white resigned here so what fascinating use of um, the tarash defense to get small advantages in the end game <laughs> of, of all places you wouldn't expect that with the tarash defense but let's have a look at that again um so it was a wild game for some time though with a lot of forcing moves at one point played by black which you didn't really really know where all these forcing moves and counter forcing moves would end so they started around uh, this situation uh, with I believe C takes B3 I think Kasparov referred to this as hard pressing in one of his books he refers to hard pressing continually putting the opponents you know under, under pressure or having to do something with forcing moves so Bishop C8 and then we see Knight G4 hitting F2 something has to be done about that Bishop D7 something has to be done about A4 Bishop takes a4, a forcing move, leading to another forcing move, having to do something with the knight. Um, so bishop takes e4, and now, okay, we see white's in trouble here. Look at all this pressure. Black has no problem pieces. If he had played knight d4, he's going straight into a self plane, or even worse, e3 would be powerful. Maybe e3 is nasty. So white has to do something clever to survive this position. So this this is a clever move. It seems to counterattack the knight, the loose the one loose piece in black's position, and then he could he, he uses the slightly weak loose rook on c7 now with his next tactic, deflection tactic. Rook takes e4. So we we get this sequence where we end up. And now an, another clever move, knight d4. So white's um, got this ending, which unfortunately is, is passive. The, the rook is passive on f1. It's it's almost un unpredictable. Un you, who would predict this from that earlier very complex middle game position that we get this ending, uh, where black's got all the pressure. But the clever thing here is the black king coming in for the attack. This this e pawn lured um, into a position on on the verge of queening, but it's actually black's resources which are very powerful here. The king coming into a very aggressive um, square g3 now, and this um, clever mating net is set up uh, with knight h2 and f2 on the cards. And even here, a mating that again is set up with just the knight and rook. Okay. Shall we have a look at another game? I would like to cover all the games of black anyway, so I hope it's quite interesting so far. Uh, so. against that uh, Pedrog uh, Nikolic okay we're gonna get another example of this Tarash uh, defense at work actually it's quite a long involved game uh, okay uh, yeah so d4 d5 just a little bit of a warning okay so c4 e6 and we see after knight c3 again this Tarash move this c5 so Siebert Tarash, you know, arch rival of Aaron Nimzovich. Apparently, they had a lot of heated chess debates. Well, Nimzovich came later. 
um, but um, I think he, he Nimzovic was irritated by um, it, apparently uh, a lot of the Tarash um, idealisms but um okay so um, Bishop g2 Bishop e7 both sides castle D takes c5, bishop takes c5 here. And now bishop g5, prompting the d pawn to move and weaken some light squares in moving to d4. Some light squares are weakened, immediately made use of knight e4. Now white gives up the dark square bishop with bishop takes f6. Which seems okay. So White's playing on the light squares in the position, and the c5 square is is often important. So again, we see the c5 square very important for White. So Rook e8, okay, Knight e1, setting up seemingly a cozy blockade to get a Knight on d3 would look quite cozy. This blockade sit scenario. Bishop f8. So, what is Kasparov's idea here in this position? Is this becoming approaching an ideal setup uh, for White? Um, well, how does Black generate some counterplay? A5. He still has got this idea in this position of maybe Queen b6 to put pressure on the Queen side. Rook fd1. And now Bishop g4. Again, this Bishop's also. Coordinating with the rook uh, for e2 pressure, we see another knight on c5. Okay, and this option available to black to take on c5, which he does take immediately in this position. So bishop takes c5, and now queen e7. Okay, so maybe in this position f5 is on the cards for that loose rook. Um, or maybe there's another idea as well. Okay, so h3 in this position, which actually um, invites a tactic. I'm not sure entirely was this intentional, um, but in this position, a tactic has been invited, uh, namely bishop takes e2. Now, if white takes on e2, then queen takes c5 using the pin, I guess. So white plays now rook e1. So what is his nifty idea here? Or was it just a blunder? Could this have been just a blunder? Because black is able to support the bishop now with d3. Um, if I ask you guys uh, now, what just happened? Do you think Ped, Predar, Pedrag, Nikolic, uh, he just blundered here? Uh, do you see any compensation for White, which is that clear? Uh, if I give you 20 seconds, starting from now. Is Black just better? He's, he's just snatched the pawn there. Anyone? <clears throat> what do you reckon? Okay, let's let's proceed anyway. So, what does White do to try and get something from this? He plays Queen C three. Rook a d8, and it looks as though well, blacks blacks are doing very well. Knight d2. This doesn't look like it was planned. Uh, knight d4. Okay, offering a5 to decentralize the queen. Um, but black has got all sorts of things now, like knight c2 maybe and stuff. H6. Okay, he's just playing this quiet move to start off with. After rook c3, now. Um, there is a threat of rook d3, one would expect sometimes, maybe not here, because two rooks is quite a lot to give up uh, for the queen. Um, 
But so Spar plays b6 hitting the queen here. Okay. Queen a6 is played. Now if queen takes b6, what would happen here? Is there an immediate uh, maybe something just um, maybe rook d6 uh, anyway white wasn't tempted to take on b6 he just plays queen a6 queen g5 hitting the knight black takes on d3 giving up um, potentially the exchange okay and I think the position is too complicated for my brain actually uh, um, maybe we should just carry this on next week actually I think my brain's been fried by this by by the previous games uh, and I think we've, we're reaching the hour mark and it's the wrong point in a very long game uh, from this position I'm not really sure okay what is going on here um, but okay let's let's just briefly try and get to the end of this game a brief and we'll, we'll look at it again next week um, so what is going on after rook takes d3 um, for some reason the spark didn't take on on d3 if he takes on d3 I don't know like this and I don't know is white doing okay he didn't take on d3 he played queen g6 he's just keeping the skewer I guess like this putting pressure on d3 and it looks quite painful uh, bishop f1 and now he wins the exchange anyway okay so he's the exchange up uh, and it's he seems to have basically won a pawn earlier and it is now just the exchange up it looks as though what's happened to Nikolic uh, this this can't be uh, all planned the exchange down for a pawn uh, so rook a1 um, b5 and not even the exchange down for a pawn soon so just the exchange down uh, so it looks like a technique position actually at move 37 um, so the exchange up against uh, with Kasparov playing black it shouldn't be that hard to convert this exchange up so let's just skim through what is he doing he's improving his king improving his king I think his first target might be f2 so he's targeting f2 now pretty soon okay that moves now g3 is probably the next target g3 okay so rook here is on the cards okay g3 again being targeted now f4 and now finally he's he's forcing uh, resignation here after h5 I think if white tries in this final position uh, g5 then I think well h4 might be strong here this, this is quite annoying um, maybe just taking on f4 and it's all collapsing um, okay maybe it wasn't as complicated as I imagined this game there was, there was a complex moment but it seemed basically uh, white let's have a quick look at this game again um, white seemed to lose <clears throat> a pawn tactically in, in a critical position let's go back to that critical position where white seemed to blunder with h3 would you all agree h3 seems like a, a big blunder uh, because of this uh, tactic that black had so h3 seems to be a blunder um, on the other hand if if he moved the rook back uh, this doesn't look too hot actually um, does it because f f5 seems plausible doesn't it f5 seems plausible to win e2 anyway
it looks as though that that's a pawn to be taken uh, and supported uh, potentially d3 here so I don't know this this looks like um, downhill from Bishop takes e2 <clears throat> so Knight d2 Queen and, and the Queen comes to g5 soon after b6 this tactic Queen takes b6 what was the idea of this so Queen a6 was played on Queen takes b6 possibly uh, an idea is Queen g5 simply maybe Queen g5 again just striking it at d2 how would white actually defend this position it seems pretty pretty bad actually uh, because of d2 say say the knight moves or d2 looks strong here or even just taking and d2 looks incredibly powerful so okay so <clears throat> queen a6 queen g5 anyway so the idea of offering the exchange it's not taken immediately it's, it's delayed taking of the exchange and then that was quite straightforward now to convert the exchange up so another Tarish leading to a, a winning ending the exchange up there was actually one more game um, which um, I had on the list potentially um, but maybe um, that was against John Timon but uh, it, was, it was a long one uh, these were quite long involved games um, I think possibly we should leave that to next week okay uh, so I hope you got something from this very brief overview of, of this this tournament with Xpaf focusing on the black pieces with with the Tarash defense um, so maybe it's a an opening you could consider experimenting with your own uh, repertoire uh, against d4 this Tarash defense um, okay so comments or questions on on here or YouTube when I upload the video to YouTube later okay so thanks very much and um, any questions otherwise I'll see you next week then okay thanks very much